Supercuts. Um, here in our theme of beginnings and firsts, um, we're talking about the first journal specifically dedicated to science. Um, and that was Philosophical Transactions, the Journal of the Royal Society. Now, oh wait, you may say, the Journal des Scavons started a couple of months earlier. But, important point, they incorporated other disciplines. So we're talking about a purely scientific publication here. And that began in 1665. Yeah, so here we have the first volume of Philosophical Transactions, which, if you want the 1665 title, Philosophical Transactions giving some account of the presence, undertakings, studies, and labors of the ingenious in many considerable parts of the world. Uh, so the, the title's changed a little bit over time, but it's striking uh, that the journal is still in existence almost 400 years, more than 400 years after its beginning. Uh, and it follows much the same format. We have the first issue here, which there's an introductory passage here. And then this is the beginning of the first issue. Number one, volume one, Philosophical Transactions in 1664-1665 uh, is what it's dated. And here is the most recent volume of Philosophical Transactions. Uh, we received this on May 26th, 2021. Uh, so it's still in existence. So we thought we might talk about kind of the difference between these two things. The thing that you don't see between the two is the uh, Philosophical Transactions in the 1600s was mostly based on letters and exchange of information between scientists and what were then referred to as natural philosophers. Uh, and in 2021, when we're shooting this, uh, it's mostly based on submissions and then peer review. Uh, so that's, that's an important uh, difference between the format of the two journals. So let's take a look at each uh, individual one and see if there's any difference. I've got a table of contents here, uh, which is fairly long and then it rolls in. What about you, Jamie? Exact same thing without the uh, fluffy prefatory matter from Henry <laughs> Oldenburg, whose uh, project Phil Trans was. This was technically his property, but we'll get into that later. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you see his name here, speaking of Henry Oldenburg, who was the secretary of the Royal Society. Uh, and it, he actually owned philosophical transactions. And so when he died, uh, there was a gap in publication. And uh, nobody's most favorite person in the Royal Society, Robert Hooke, uh, ended up publishing in the interim this volume called Philosophical Collections. Now, philosophical collections, it's unusual to have a complete set of philosophical transactions, but it's even more unusual to have a set of philosophical collections because there were only a few hundred issues, a few hundred copies of these issues made. And so there's only a few remaining in existence. So this, uh, this is especially rare, uh, like I said, and it makes a complete set. So what we'll do is uh, we'll remove all this material, we'll reset the table, and we'll talk about some really interesting articles that first appeared in Philosophical Transactions in the 16, 17, and 1800s. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Paper Cuts. So Jamie and I have uh, selected four of our very favorite articles from Philosophical Transactions to kind of give you an idea of the breadth and depth of things that first appeared in Philtrans, what we call Philtrans as a short title. Uh, the one that I have here in front of me is February 19th, 1671-72 uh, is what it's marked. And this is the first publication by Isaac Newton in Philosophical Transactions. It is Surprise About Mathematics and Physics. Uh, no great surprise there. It doesn't have any great illustrations, but that is the first appearance. I, I think my second favorite one is, and frankly the one that I show younger kids because it grosses them out, is this one. Uh, this is a uh, letter on the scurf of teeth by Anton van Leeuwenhoek. So Leeuwenhoek was the first person to really employ a microscope and do observations, and in this fold-out plate, records the first printed image of bacteria, which you may be asking yourself, I just said scurf of teeth. What the heck is scurf of teeth? Disgustingly enough, uh, Leeuwenhoek took the plaque from between his wife's teeth, put it underneath his uh, compound microscope, and this is what he observed. Uh, millions of tiny bodies is what he described it as. So uh, when you uh, think about that, think about flossing and brushing your teeth. Uh, and then uh, after that, there's something that's astronomical. This is much later, so I should say this was uh, 1684, 
And this is 1786, so we skipped a little bit, mm -hmm. but this is one of the things I love to hear Jamie talk about because she knows so much about this person. Well, this is really exciting because uh, part of, I think, what brings us so far into um, the future, so to speak, if we're starting in um, 1665, now we're hurtling far and wide <laughs> into almost the end of the 18th century, and that is because it took just that long for work by a woman under her name to be published in Philosophical Transactions. Um, notably, so this is a letter that was read at the Society, but Caroline Herschel, the woman whose article this is, didn't read it herself. She didn't actually go. And that gets to another kind of interesting thing about Philosophical Transactions in these early years, which is especially when it's under Oldenburg's control, it's really about creating almost a news publication about science, where it's these letters that are coming in to the society, to Oldenburg, and then later to the secretaries of the society who take over the publication. Um, so it's sometimes things that actually were read aloud in the society, sometimes correspondence that's sent there because they know, similar to how scientific publication works today, that it'll be publicized through being um, shared with the society. Um, so this here is an article. Um, that uh, Car about Caroline Herschel's the first discovery of a comet. She discovered several comets during her lifetime, but this is the first one. And um, her brother also uh, contributes to this article to um, confirm that her work is good. And I think what's one of the things that's really sad and also very charming and interesting about this, it's very brief, it literally begins here and ends here, and she talks about how of an evening, while her brother was away, she had the opportunity to do the looking through the telescope instead of recording what her brother looking through the telescope was seeing. And on this particular night where she just happens to get a chance to look through the telescope, she sees her first ever comet. And this plate is reproduced from her drawings. Um, she was just a beautiful draftswoman. Um, her work is really precise. Um, so this plate here shows, um, these circles show what she's seeing and the movements of the bodies that she's observing. And see the comet is marked here, it almost looks like a dandelion <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're looking at it. And she's got the, the angle uh, at which the comet is traveling. Hey Jamie, can I ask you a question? Why is the plate printed so strangely all the way across the page like that? What purpose does that serve? <laughs> I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> this is one of, I think, my favorite features of books from this period. It's just such a clever piece of technology. Um, the reason why you would print your plate that far out is because um, engravings like this had to be printed separately from text. If you'll remember back to our episode about woodcuts, yeah. um, a copper plate can't be printed in the same time as letterpress text, so it needs to be inserted separately. But the way you can make that work to your advantage is you can arrange the plate so that when it's folded out, you can still read the text to which it refers by just having it folded out there. And you see you've got this really generous margin to be able to read and consult. It's just mm, a really <laughs> cool little, it's almost like having two monitors. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I love this. Um, and then we'll close, we'll dip back into the 17th century here. Um, this is another really special plate. Um, so we're now back in um, 1687, and this is a really exciting piece of printing. Um, this is a really tricky technical feat that's being accomplished because this plate corresponds to an article that's all about how one might begin to create a standardized color reference. So a way that you say, you know, if you're referring to um, cerulean blue, you have a very specific blue in mind. Um, as you can imagine, similar to how um, it was very difficult to standardize illustrations before um, the advent of woodblocks and printed illustration, um, it's very difficult to standardize color pigments. And that is just um, one such attempt. Yeah, and so this plate has all of the different color mixes and his proposals for standardized colors. This actually isn't printed. Um, you can see there are these little daubs of color. So that has to be assembled by hand, which is a really complicated feat in and of itself. But that's the kind of thing that shows you sort of the diversity of what's being done at the time. Um, you're thinking really holistically about um, science and technology. So it kind of gives you an, an idea of the depth and breadth of philosophical collections, philosophical transactions. Um, 
We've got color, we have uh, observational astronomy, we have observations done uh, through uh, Leeuwenhoek's microscope, and mathematics and physics done by Sir Isaac Newton. So this is just the tiniest sliver of glimpse into early philosophical transactions and the Royal Society, uh, and we hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us on Paper Cuts, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.